with Francois uh, Ule and uh, you know ever since phonetics came out I don't know when, when was that also that was oh that's 2002 yeah that, that that's record man that the compositions there that I was just like man what is this so but <laughs> but anyway I, I want to start with the new one the weight of light which yeah. uh, you know again blew my mind because uh, there are so many layers and what you do and it's incredible especially if you consider, you know, the solo piano heritage yeah. before us. And you just seem to do it in your completely individual way. And I just wanted to start this with asking you, like, how do you prepare the piano? And because you have this amazing uh, kind of combination between prepared piano and normal piano, and do you prepare it for every tune separately or do you use it like for, for the weight of light for the whole set then? And no, I mean, how is, how is your approach here? Yeah, there's a preparation for each uh, composition actually. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. But, but um, I'm, um, I always have, when I'm, I write new music, I always have to consider that I'm going to be performing it live. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> and so the, uh, the set of tunes uh, I, I organize and, and write actually... Uh, um, is is such that there will not there will not be so much hassle in preparing the piano, especially okay. between between the numbers. So I have to be cautious about this. And you will probably you probably have noticed that there the, the preparations are actually not so many. Uh, I mean there, there are yeah like I mean, some, the record, yeah. There's, there's one that's that's uh, uh, that's that's uh, that's actually quite prepared and that would be for instance that would be an opening piece for a gig because then oh, i can okay. that's spend the yeah. time i can spend the time for a, a, a sound check to um to to prepare it because it would take maybe for that particular number it would take like five six minutes to do yeah know? but yeah. Most, most of them is i can do this within uh less than a minute probably you know, so yeah, what I use mostly is um, little little twigs of wood that I curl myself, that I pick up uh, mm -hmm. uh, around. You know, just pick them up on, like, have uh, wood from Scandinavia and wood yeah. from uh, Canada and from uh, Central Africa. And I haven't made this Slovenia yet, but for sure I will pick up some when I come. <laughs> yeah, you should. And I have a certain a sort of relation to each of them, and, and uh, especially the moment I cut them, I try them. Uh, they might not sound of similar. Uh, I mean, they might not sound the same on, on depending on what piano I use, but but it's a family of sound that I will a certain a certain density of the wood, a certain thickness mm -hmm. of the twig, will make a particular like subtone or uh, uh, irrational uh, overtone relation to the. Yeah. I love Real that, yeah. the string so so uh this this um it came actually pretty quite naturally for me uh at first as a child where, where i started to uh to play with a little mallet you know and uh yeah. on the family upright piano and i was curious with with you know you know with also with the with the nails and you know but it's not it's not until uh the age of what um about 20 years old or something 21 maybe that i uh uh actually no i was 19 when the when when the uh, ligeti piano study the first oh, book yeah, was yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. was was published and uh, i was already a, a great fan of ligeti's works and uh like his two piano pieces like momentum or self portrait yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. beautiful Kantarsky brother record and, and I, have, I had the good fortune of living in Paris so I, I was able to witness actually um, uh, the, uh, the, fr the, fr the premiering of the piano studies uh, played by Fulbert oh. Benfield uh, at the French radio and Ligeti oh, was right. himself was here with together with Shimura Aram the uh, musical um, uh, ethnologist and they were of course introducing the audience to uh, pygmy music which i already liked a lot yeah. uh, on behalf of a, a friend of mine uh, caroline bourgin she's a she's a she was a, 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 a world music 
producer and record producer for France, for the France music, uh, for, sorry, for the Radio France label called mm. Okora, which is a major label for uh, uh, world music, well, starting in the 50s, you know. And, and oh, wow. so that was, a, so when I understood, I mean, there was a, suddenly a connection between, the, I didn't know Ligeti was so fond of, of Pygmy music, you know, so it's all, suddenly things made, made totally so, sense. Yeah. Uh, so my, <laughs> Since I didn't have such a, 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 a good classical music level at the piano, I'm not, I'm not from the uh, seraglio of, of classical music at all. Mm -hmm. uh, funny story with classical music. And um, I started to, I mean, my aim would suddenly became to, um, uh, to be able to play, uh, at maybe not all of them, but actually a few, a few of uh, Ligeti piano studies. And especially one I started oh. with, with uh, practicing was the one called Fanfare. Uh, and uh, and and there's lots of detailed accents yeah. that you have to play in order to reveal the layers of 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 of, of uh, I would call it linguistics. You know, it's linguistics yeah. of yeah. sounds. Like, it's like syntax to me. And uh, and so I started to put to use little bits of eraser that I was cutting and placing them between the strings like that. And uh, because for two reasons, because first it would of course alter the sound of the real yeah. string it would mute them in a way so they would sound differently but also physically in my in the return of the hit of the hammer on the string there would be something different that will make me i found uh in tiger the mm. the physical impulse i had to to generate uh to play yeah. the music pro properly and since I, I started to work on this music um also as an improviser, because my, my way to assimilate the concepts of, 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 of Ligeti's ideas, uh, especially rhythmically, uh, yeah. totally passionate. Anyway, I found a direct link to, to the, the school of, of drumming from like Ed Blackwell or, you know, all, uh, Max Roach and, and, and the, the uh, yeah. polyrhythm, polyrhythmic playing of, of, I don't know, I mean, Thelonious Monk, you know, for yeah. me, it was all like all in all, it was one. And so... I found myself improvising on, on, on these layers ideas and, and uh, it didn't take very long before I used uh, piece, bits of wood because then somebody introduced me, a, a neighbor of mine introduced me to the prepared piano music by John Cage, which I, I, I didn't really know. I mean, I knew yeah. a, a lot about John Cage. I had even had studied some of his pieces in a, at a composition class, I mean, analysis class. Yeah. And, uh, and and suddenly he played me these 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 these, tag, these tracks, you know, by uh, how was that? It was the one of the uh, yeah um, David Tudor version, and I realized oh, but so I didn't I didn't study myself kind of thing. You know, it was really naive for me. Yeah. And of course, the yeah. world of John Cage prepared piano music hit me, and I, I of course I studied the uh, sonatas and interludes. Yeah. I, I performed some, did some sort of. Uh, uh, events around uh, we called it damage to John Cage and sort of you know all that that was together with the collective with uh, Noel Akshote and yeah, and uh, and yeah. Uh, uh, we, we did that, that that series of concerts called damage to John Cage where we actually played Cage properly and, and but we would uh, make improvised interludes and stuff like that that was so good so that all that year of my I would say this this moment in my life was a very very passionate moment of of suddenly sort of discovering that everything was everywhere, you know, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> and so this, this also led me to, um, to, uh, trans to transcriptions of a lot of uh, great players. I, I mean, like Ornette, I did a lot of Ornette transcriptions. Oh, really? Oh, wow. A lot yeah. of Bud, a lot of Monk, of course, a lot of, uh, you know, some, some, some Coltrane, some Dexter Gordon. I mean, I was, I was trying to, transcribe music but not in the in, not in the aim of memorizing memorizing anything but more than uh, it was more like revealing where the shapes are where what's the momentum yeah. where's the uh the inner pulse uh and so i found myself transcribing some big Ag 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 pygmy um a traditional i mean I mean, music. I'm, I'm even saying traditional they still practice yeah, this, yeah, sure. this music in the rainforest uh although they're very endangered as we know um and so i read that book 
and uh, all the writing is about you know pygmy music by by shimra rom and and at some point i was not totally satisfied with the western way to explain this music i it felt to me yeah. that it came from another essence than actually the western essence which is of course obvious and so i started to look for a um a, a, a graphic sort of way to to transcribe this music without having to um without having to use the idea of hierarchy like a bar signature would be a hierarchy yeah. in the western um, music uh notation uh that's also i think very much related to the classes i had with alan silva uh, oh yeah back in my teens because i was uh, oh, wow. I, I found myself at the age of uh 17 i think uh in alan silva alan was living in town in paris in paris and he had founded a school called aacp institute for artistic and cultural perception oh, wow where actually people like uh, I, I would see people play like uh, like uh, bobby few steve lacy uh, uh and then i met mal waldron there maybe we could we can talk talk through mal later on and 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 so as a, as a, ironically uh, uh, alan said oh yeah but no okay right okay so i played in this big band called celestial communication orchestra from yeah, the age of yeah. 17 18 which was for me incredible because i was amongst all this Paris improviser scene with yes. some 30 people blowing freely. I mean, it was a world of, of dream for me. It was incredible. And so Alan suddenly decided, like, I had to take piano lessons with him, which, oh. which I mean, you know, with all, all the great respect I have and I had for Alan at this time, I thought, oh, this is not, this is not so logical, is it? Because he's not a piano player, he's a bass player, and I actually love his bass playing. Yeah. And so I started to go to Alan's. Uh, classroom like once a month uh i was still in high school and he would ask oh. me every week to play something for him that i had conceived and practiced and rehearsed or something even then it was the final result was improvised but with a with a sort of concept so what yeah. you bring me what what are you bringing me um, this this month and he insisted on notation a lot and he insisted a lot on on uh, on finding my own way to actually uh, pre-visualize uh, musical yeah. momentum that i would actually reveal to him at the at the at the private piano class and at the same time i was or a little bit later a year maybe or i i, I had a new friend she was um she was a comedian and a writer a poet uh, of my age and she had studied ch chinese and at her place i found uh, methods like books to you know i mean study books for chinese yeah. and one one particularly uh, uh caught my attention was one about the ancient um chinese uh writing system before the ming dynasty before the 11th century uh where there are many many correspondences with with egyptians for instance like you know the sun oh, being a circle yeah. with, the, with a dot and stuff like that and this is when i really started to find a notation for me uh, in relation to the fact that in Chinese you first learn the simple words that have the less lines. Yeah, sure. You, you, yeah, and yeah. so, uh, and I was thinking that's something sort of like that I need because for me, like if you take an ornate common phrase, uh, there is an essence there that should be simple to write. Even then, the the global process of ornette is genius and of course yeah, nobody sure. really like ornette and it was the, not my my goal to be able to play like him but actually understand what was it that he practiced or yeah, yeah. thought about uh, in order to play like this and so that was in 1992 i was i was i was uh, first trying to to write horizontally the syllables of of the academic chance and then suddenly i lifted the the characters of these little signs and it, they became they appeared like words like ancient uh yeah uh, uh, oh. uh, berber like you could say there's actually a little word i use that that's that means human in berber language uh, uh that of course they didn't know about it so of yeah. course you always find matches uh, but what this led me to have a certain way to to uh, to practice uh uh, lines, melodies, oh. layers, uh, 
because of course, if you if you get to a, a simple system that's very very simple after all, uh, your ears start to hear music like this. Yeah, and so if you listen to a a, a Ravel concerto, suddenly you you have certain layers of the instrumentation of the orchestra that appear like a like a painting element, and then there's yeah, there's, like a wave there's, uh, or something, yeah. there's linguistics appearing and different layers. Or you know, I was also listening to a lot of um, checking a lot of of, of Bartok's, uh, I mean, particularly Microcosmos, and oh, yeah, sure. and because uh, I was also teaching to kids at this time a lot, so I was using Microcosmos and uh, and had friends in Hungary. So when I was first in Budapest, I suddenly heard that everybody could sing anything from Microcosmos. Yeah. You know, uh, for a Parisian, that was wow. You yeah. Know? Anyway, but this was the, the these were the times of of this kind of discovery, which actually I never thought it would they would it would stay so present in my way to approach music and write music. And it's, I've been using this this all my life, and it's also a way for me to conceive music away from the instrument, which is something I received from my my composition teacher uh, Solange Ancona, who passed actually last summer, and and uh, she was a student of Olivier Messiaen. Uh -huh. at the Paris Conservatory and she was of course a lot uh, she was quoting uh, the maestro um, she was calling him uh, a lot and especially in the um, the demanding uh, role he has to his students all of them to actually imagine the living sound but inside yourself rather than yeah. uh, and so the little calligraphic system I found was a way to just sit on my day at my study and just draw lines and, and project myself into imagination imaginary worlds rather than tr trying to find a good idea at the piano which and actually piano, yeah. yeah which i never do when i write music for my oh, own wow. uh, for my, my own bands i never sit at the piano i actually the first steps are always yeah, i like, wanted to ask you about that yeah how, how do you yeah, do that always like, like taking notes describing what i want to hear then Oh. The next step would be to 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 draw calligrams and more recently like circles and stuff expressing s different speeds and vectors I call them um, and and so uh, once I'm I've, I've got I've gotten somewhere with with like a page of music to be written finally with notes I might sit down at the piano but that's already when the notes are are written so. Mm. Um, I think this explains a certain pace, a certain relation to melody in my in my in my tunes that yep. uh, uh, that contain an idea of 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 little territory in the in the sense of of the richness of 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 of, of heritage or self heritage. You know, yep. that's also related to the writings of Gilles Deleuze and and um, and uh, Guattari, uh, especially a, a book called uh, Thousand. Plateaus mm -hmm. that a student of mine offered me in uh, when I was about 22. Uh, he was studying anthropology and he said, "Oh, you 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 should definitely write this because you what you say when you teach is actually sort of similar." And I read this book and there's a chapter about lullabies and little little micro melodies that ah, define wow. our our territories. Like uh, there's the image of a of a child who's lost in the uh, in the in the darkness of a forest, and the first the first reflex of of a, of a child or anybody would make would probably to sing something you know. And yeah, if you sure. something you know as a child, you think you sing something your 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 parents or your 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 friends have been singing or something you've been learning at school or at music school. But but something territorial, not in the sense of owning something, but in the sense of feeling good and feeling yeah. surrounded by 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 a warm uh, fort. Yeah, so, yeah. so that's the correlation of all that, that actually led me to uh, a certain way to, to write music. And of course, the, the um, uh, discovery of, of, of uh, in particular, uh, Steve Coleman's works in the beginning with, with Steve Coleman, like the quintet with Steve Coleman and, 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 and Smitty and all that, which, yeah, led I love that. To, yeah. which led me to get to the BAM Center. Uh, study with these masters uh, has uh, really um, uh, developed a, 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 a curiosity for, for for time division. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, uh, and the mathematics of of the little it's 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 never very 
if you look, I mean, I've, I've, I've two days worked in mathematics. What I do is, is absolutely like level ground one, you know, it's first level, but in, it's enough to actually observe the behaviors of certain functions. And I use some imaginary numbers to, to a sort of put a veal on a, on a, on a, on something that would appear like a law, you know, yeah. or scale. If there's a scale somewhere, maybe I put a, a, a little mathematical veal to actually alter one note. So it's not a scale. Mm. It wow. sounds like something we know already. And, but it's very simple. It's a, it's like, it's like a game really is I'm, I'm having a lot of fun when I write music. Sometimes I throw a lot of things away. And what I do is that I never keep my, um, my sketches. I always, when I'm, when I'm finished with one tune, I, I, I just throw the sketches. So I don't even remember how I did it. Oh, wow. um, that, so that forces me to, to renew my uh, observations and, uh, and uh, I mean, there, there are a few things that I would use regularly, but, but uh, uh, not never, ne definitely never as a formula, you know? Yeah. Ne yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting how you approach rhythm because, you know, when I listen to your, I don't know, The Loop of Chicago, you played it with Gerald and John. Yeah, already. yeah. And, and uh, the older, like even on New Turn, you know, I, I, I'm obsessed with rhythm as well. And when writing music with art rhythms and how something yeah. goes over and, you know, this micro subdivisions. And, and how do you approach this when writing a tune? I don't know. Uh, in 21 or do you know I'm going to write in 7 and this is going to be 21 and then it's going to oh, be 42 usually, or... usually when I start something I don't know what it's going to be uh, uh, time wise you know like actually the loop of Chicago is uh, uh, is 3 against 5 plus 4 against 5 that's just the, that's just the grid yeah uh, I don't remember how it came but it probably came from uh I don't know. I lost. I, I don't keep. Yeah. So I, can't, I cannot really say. But what what I mean is just for me. If you if you I could send you the score. Oh please! Uh, I would love to see yeah, that. Please. There's there's information on the score that actually we never looked at with Gerald and, and John because we did, didn't have the time. But the way they approached it was was just so so. You know, there's not much I say to these guys. Yeah, they're <laughs> just, monsters. Yeah, it's not, it's just not what they do. And I yeah. feel like I'm flying. I'm, I'm flying when I play with them. Yeah. So, Actually, we have a new record out this week. Really? With oh, the, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's called Gentle Ghosts. Oh, on clean uh, feet or? Pro, no, that's on the French label of um, of the Strasbourg Jazz Festival. It's called Jazz Door Series. Oh, so okay. they, they were releasing live concerts, and now they do... Uh, oh, man. Since they, it, since they said everything stopped for a year, they decided, oh, we have a little money left. We will release a few records. Which oh, wow. Oh, that's to release that record. No, I, not, I don't know what's going on with clean feet, but... I'm not hearing from uh, from Clean Feet anymore. For from Pedro, oh, well, okay. I don't know, no idea. But anyway, I don't want to <laughs> extend. Yeah, that. I know. <laughs> but anyway, but uh, yeah. So back to uh, the Loop of Chicago. Uh, it came from an experience I had with the singer with singer uh, Claudia Sola, the French singer. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, working with her in Chicago and, and with with uh, Chicago uh, musicians, and we had an afternoon off, and and we decided it was a beautiful day that we're going to go on that. Uh, sky train you know mm -hmm. in the center and just loop downtown and take maybe take a few pictures and then the light going to be different each time we loop you know and we're sort of dreamy about this yeah but, but, but uh, a few minutes later we realized you actually cannot go circle uh, like you would do the circle line in London and you can stay eternally on the circle yeah. line <laughs> and so, uh, uh, so we found ourselves suddenly in the in the west, and suddenly in the, in, in the north, and uh, and so we had to take another train back to the loop. So that loop of Chicago became like a, a, an afternoon of of fun, of like we're getting lost here. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and so it's the idea that something you perceive as simple can sometimes turn you into a dreamy state. And so yeah. uh, that was the idea of the tune, and the melody is sort of flying on top. Uh, there's nothing that actually is that's supposed to fit with with the grid. Oh, you know, okay. the, the person blowing the, the melody, in, in this case, it's Mark. Um, uh, there's just points we meet, you know, and uh, uh, usually the tunes I write have something pretty special rhythmically and something very uh, free in, in the in the melodic flow. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 
And I hardly use time division in melodies. I, I usually uh, indicate momentums of lines, I mean, groups of, of notes with an indication of, of, of speed, which I call vectorial. It's like a vector of a uh, certain speed, the expression of certain speed. And we rehearse, rehearse it together, like for that uh, record, Spots and Stripes with, with Mike yeah. and Ron and Gerald. We spent a day at uh, John before, uh, before playing a gig and the recording came, uh, took place the, the day after. Uh, there was a moment John and Jill took a break and Mark and I, we spent, I think a lot, like a lot, an hour and a half or two hours on each detail of each line of each really? tune. Oh, wow. that we do. And Mark asking me, how's that? And I would play him. It's quite oral. It's quite oral. But there are two things that are central is the accents and, and the, the speed, the momentum. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, this is something that strikes me a lot when I see, uh, you know, a lot of people pub they publish some some transcriptions on Facebook, and and I I, I hardly see any accents, and and uh, I find it quite amazing because to me the accent make is the a phrase, rhythm. yeah, it's the accent of rhythm. I mean, if if I've, I always do when I teach my kids, you know, so if I speak with no accent, nobody's going to understand it. Yeah. It's just music, especially with piano players. I mean, it's easy to play fast on the piano and just to play like scales and stuff. But if you don't, if you don't input some intention of, of accents, one loses attention. Well, I lose attention. So yeah. I'm very demanding to myself. And since I've been thinking about this a lot, uh, my mother language is French. I, I took I mean, I, I was very lucky to learn English as a child. Um, and so this is two worlds in between. I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of between two worlds. Of course, French is, is more central, but I do a lot of English speaking and reading and all that. Uh, yeah. So it's two, two rhythms, two rhythms of language. And of course, English has something with the history of jazz. That's, of course, totally obvious. And so I started to study the rhythm in books you know, by improv improvising on books. Uh, also some German I did, some Spanish, uh, uh, just to observe what's the, the, the general way, the flow, and uh, uh, observing with, uh, you know, early Belevens, early Herbie, what's what's going on between these two? There's so much in common, but at the same time, this this they're going in two different parts. And what is the, the element, this mysterious element that we all like yeah. in this like that so that's that's how i got to um, to this uh, this sense of uh, maybe detail and since french have has very very little number of words that have more than five syllables basically five it's really quite mm. extreme in french as opposed to dutch that i studied too yeah. at some point, where you can actually glue yeah, concepts. yeah. i don't know about slovenian but yeah, Slovenia and German, kind of the same also, yeah. You can, oh, yeah, you can you can glue things, concepts, yeah. you know. Uh, we, we, in French, if you do this, you need to have a little line, like yeah. a half. Yeah. And it's called, uh, it's called mot valise, it's called uh, uh, a, 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 a luggage word. <laughs> a word that has luggage behind it. Yeah, but, makes sense. But it's not, so French is, is very cut into, into, you know, and English has also rather small, small yeah. words in, in terms of number of, of syllables. And so I started to to uh, to play cards with this. Also, draw cards with. My daughter is, is secretly walking. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> she just finished school, so she's happy. She could have a. a yeah, she, uh, come on. We had a nice. great uh, uh, night of sleep. Um, and so I started to to draw cards that I would place on the piano, you know, and improvise just with this number of syllables. And and if it's oh, similar yes. to Hungarian, for instance, I will ax make an accent on the first syllable of the group. If it's if it's a uh, uh, you know it, you could have an accent at the very last, and and you know depending on the language you're interested yeah. in. And, and, and it's true that as a child I was anyway curious with language because my dad had a, an old uh, shortwave radio. An old Grundig, I still have yeah, it. Yeah, and, and really, was oh, yeah. shortwave radio and some. What is this? So that was maybe I don't know Khmer language or, or, uh, or I don't know. You know, yeah, Sanskrit, Sanskrit from India or, yeah. or 
or Lingala language from from uh, from Congo, and I was very curious. I didn't take notes, but I remember spending time just being curious about, hey, what's this sound I don't like? You know, it's probably the reason why I developed this 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 sort of curiosity. Yeah, makes sense. The, I, I, I I just wanted to uh, ask you about you know you mentioned like practicing phrases with Mark, right? And uh, on phonetics, that's the, I I you know I tried to write out make lead sheets kind of for myself back then yeah and you know i i, I kind of figured I, I didn't then write them in quadruplets or whatever i just wrote them like you said in uh rubato phrases over certain yeah. rhythms yeah. and yeah. is this also like how you like mend de jour and those tunes like multi yes absolutely. absolutely that's how you did it also right yeah yeah okay yeah. good yeah uh there are tunes that are totally um fitting a grid mm -hmm. Um, but it's be, it's 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 more rare. It's more rare, actually. It depends on the groups I write for. Like, for instance, we've uh, started to rehearse again with an old band called Cartet. Yeah, oh, really? Oh man! Yeah, with Guillaume it, and Hubert Dupont and uh, uh, Stéphane Gallo being super busy uh, now with the gig starting again. He's so he could yeah. not really come in anymore to rehearse and all that. So, so we decided to uh, with his approval to, to change drummer and we, we got now this new young drummer who was actually in New York for, for before the, the COVID came. His name is Samuel Bear and he's uh -huh. like 26 years old and he was my student at Paris Conservatory and he's, uh -huh. he's okay. and now so we just rehearsed for a week and so I brought tunes for that for that band that are actually pretty strict in terms of grooves. Yeah, it's a different concept. Yeah. Uh, Guillaume does that too. He's, he's very strict about the grid, but suddenly he might come up with 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 something that's that's very free. It's yeah. just a collective momentum that we will flow, that we look for. And and so, uh, um, yeah, usually when I get to, to stick to the grid, that comes from a quite mathematical... Uh, yeah, that makes little, sense. Little then, research. Yeah. Uh, when I like to this idea of something that's nomad melodically, uh, uh, and something that's that's uh, striated, grid wise, groove yeah. wise. But the idea in the grid for me is not to. Um, I'm not interested so much in having people know where the downbeat is. Uh, like when I play a loop of Chicago solo, of course there's I know I, there's always sort of a downbeat, but I let my my actually my body be taken by the the flow, and sometimes uh, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. Yeah, sure. But that's when I do solo. Of course, if I do this with the band, I'll be more strict. But it's very interesting for me to sort of to get. Getting lost is interesting too in music, I think, because it can it can create poetry, you know. Yeah, definitely. And uh, and my also my my sort of obsession, I would say, is to let the uh, listener choose the relation to time. Yeah, and yeah. So this also comes from the uh, an observation I made from from uh, uh, witnessing a. a concerts like or they call quartet for instance with with don and then yeah. lucky to see this band with bill higgins back in the, in the 87 and uh, oh, wow. i was observing the people tapping their feet and it was interesting to see that nobody was really tapping the same way although they were yeah, always sure. always played the pulse but and then a bit later uh on the same moment uh, same year i would say that the, was the year after they followed quintet with with steve coleman and playing some Doug Hammond stuff or Steve Yeah, Thomas. I love that stuff, yeah. You know, and, and then observing people tapping feet. And I felt, hey, all these people tap their feet differently, but they, they, they feel great about it, <laughs> you know? So yeah. I was thinking, hey, after all, and that's also what made, for me, what, what created that sort of, I was really taken by Ligeti's magical uh, uh, knowledge of, of getting us ourselves lost in music and, 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 and just accept the music like you're in a bath of music you know yeah and yeah i i, I think I, I consciously wanted to 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 grab this as okay this is what i like to experiment so i, I want to develop this as as a as a as an artist and maybe people have this same feeling when they listen to my work and and it's a way for me to 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 revisit the the the, the history of the, of this great music and uh, and to uh 
to pay tribute finally to to all these creators that that were before me, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, I'm thinking in particular about Mal Waldron, who show, sort of showed me the way because he told me when I was very young too. Yeah, how, oh, how did this happen with Mel? Actually, uh, your story. How did you guys meet through Alan Silva or? Yes, through Alan Silva, absolutely. Uh, Alan, in in, the, in this music school called ASCP, there was a there was a jazz club called this uh, the Sphere Jazz Club. And I would help with, uh, I was at the same time studying sound engineering. So I would help with uh, a little PA or just, you know, just give a, just give a, a, a microphone to Sam Rivers for his flute, you know. <laughs> you know I didn't realize what I was, I know I was 17, 18, yeah. know, incredible. And uh, I remember even Sam Rivers asking me to mic the piano. And I was, are you serious? I mean, Mr. Rivers? Uh, do you really want me to mic the piano? Yeah, yeah, I'll play the piano. And I didn't know if Sam could play like, could what's going to become one of my main influence at the piano. Because yeah. I saw Sam play the piano with such an incredible freedom. And yeah. I felt the music he was playing on the keyboard was totally elastic. I felt this is how I want to play. You know? <laughs> so actually, now we mentioned Sam, he was probably my main influence at the instrument. Oh, wow. that, that, that series of, of evenings, uh, once uh, Mal Waldron came to play solo and that was that he, he was there because he was probably playing with Lacey the day after and, and Alan offered him to play solo. And, and so I knew who Mal Waldron was uh, uh, by name. And of course he wrote you know, he wrote Soul Eyes. There were tunes yeah, sure. I knew from him that he wrote and all that. And so I listened to his set, to his two sets, completely mesmerized <laughs> by the fact, that, also by the fact that not only the playing was was incredible, but the fact he was playing an upright piano that I knew well because I was playing this piano at workshops and all that. Yeah. And he could make it sound like beauty when I hated this piano and I thought, I thought it sounded crap and horrible, you know? And that sort of of course changed my life because i thought okay so it's not the piano it, i can actually make it's, it something yeah. because mal can do it and of course we're talking about mal waldron and so at the at the after the concert very very naively you know i went to him and said uh, uh i really loved your playing and uh, i'd love to study with you and uh, he said well i'm not i'm not he was very kind man very gentle and, and he said oh i'm not i'm not a i'm not a teacher i'm not a Jazz, or jazz piano, whatever teacher, yeah. but we can play together. <laughs> oh, wow. And I said, "Oh, really?" Uh, and he said, "Yeah, you're around tomorrow. Uh, can you come here tomorrow afternoon, and we could play for a couple of hours?" Wow. You know, I was, I was, of course, scared to death. So, uh, and at breakfast the next morning, I told my dad, uh, "Could you write me a letter for for the school because I'm going to have to skip uh, because I had." this proposal from Mal and then he's not going to be in town anymore. And uh, I think I should really go. And my dad was collecting articles by Michael Zwerin, you know, in the Herald Tribune. Yeah, yeah. And he would keep those that he was interested in and usually buy a record or two by the artist he was reading about. And he had, the last page he had was Mal Waldron <laughs> and he hadn't bought a record yet. So he looked and he said, sure, you can go see Mal Waldron and give him my regards, you know. So my father signed me that thing to skip to skip school. And so I spent two hours with Mal. Uh, and he said, okay, so I improvise something and you follow me. And mm. the opposite. And uh, I still have a cassette of that somewhere. I know it's there. Oh, really? then, oh. So every once he was coming to town again, he would always tell me, call, call at my parents' uh, and say, I'm going to be, tell, tell my wife, or maybe I was picking up the phone, I don't remember. And he was saying, okay, I'm going to be there in, in two weeks. Bring me some music or see you at the sound, after sound show, you can play me something. And this is how uh, a few years later, he finally you know, wrote this recommendation to get to the BAMF Center. Ah, that's how it happened. Okay. And so did Steve Lacey. Of course, I met Steve through the, through, um, through, uh, through Mal. Uh, yeah, sure. And then Steve started to be really uh, 
father like with me and so I met Jean-Jacques of course uh, years later I started to play with Jean-Jacques who called me the kid for until oh yeah you did that record you know, the, the, he passed you know I was always the kid <laughs> Alors petit, uh, you know yeah that was that's, that's how it happened you know and, and then Mal said uh, at some point he said um, I was playing some some brought him a, a recording I did of, 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 of around about midnight with a few prepared sounds and, and, he, oh. and he listened and he said this is very nice Benoit but you should do this with your music if you play if you play around about midnight you should play there are changes you should and he's played he's played it to me and uh, and I don't don't he said like don't I mean don't you want to care about all this rehard thing yeah, yeah, yeah. Music it makes sense. The reharmonized version of this. It was quite in fashion in the eighties, I have to say, and and he said, no, you'd rather if you want to, you know, write on your own ideas, you know. And then at this time, I had an offer from BMG by a producer, this this label that had a, an office in Paris, and they offered me to play to do a. It would have been my first record of of monk tunes, like homage to monk. And I asked Mal for advice. I said, what do you think? I have this offer. And he said, why do you want to pay homage to Monk uh, playing his music? And the best homage you could do was would be to do your own yeah, music. Yeah. Yeah. And so I said to these BMG guys, I said, um, okay, I, I, I'm on, but with my own tunes. And of course, I've never heard of them. <laughs> that, you know. But that was, I mean, that was, you, you know, that was such, a, it's not even a kick in the ass. It was just a, a lifetime uh, push. He just pushed me yeah. into something that I could never look back after that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm eternally uh, grateful to Mal for his, for his. Uh, so important, yeah. Or he's uh, took, taking me under his wings. I mean, realizing now, I mean, now that my kids are this age, you know, that I was I was seventeen or eighteen when he did this. You know, it's 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 very lucky. So I'm tr I'm trying to 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 continue that 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 line of 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 uh, I call it ear attitude, you know, or ear altitude, you know. Yeah, yeah. Just, just try to be creative in your in, in the way in, in the way I can do it the best, which is the closest to my my own uh, story, you know. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to catch you here. Uh, you, know, you mentioned Banff, right? And yeah, uh, you know Dave Holland and Steve Coleman. Uh, what was your impression when coming there? Like, uh, what what did that do to like uh, opposed to Mel Waldrons and Alan Silvas? Like, because that's kind of different concept musically. Like, what did happen there with you? Uh, with what musical? happened is actually I knew I heard about the Banff Center totally by chance at the Canadian Center where I, I went to an exhibition about Glenn Gould, and I had met this guy Bruno Montsaint-Jean, the filmmaker who made all these films about Gould. I had mm -hmm. met him in the recording studio. Uh, I was doing some pop thing with a group and he said uh, oh you like Glenn Gould you should come to the exhibition I'm doing a little lecture there and out from this this lecture there was a door saying studies in Canada but you know I was studying sound engineering there was maybe some nice engineering school in Canada I didn't know about the BAM Center at all and I got into this little office and there was the old lady who said oh I've just got this flyer today and the flyer was the jazz workshop led by uh, by by Dave Holland, and I couldn't believe it because they oh. were it was Dave, Steve, uh, Marvin Smith, Muhal, Richard Abrams, oh. um, uh, Abraham and Zinia, um, uh, Julian Priester. I mean, it, oh wow, yeah. basically, yeah. Cool. And uh, so I applied. I applied. I was just in time to apply, and uh, so I recorded a tape with 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 friends. Actually, uh, the, the first drummer of Quartet and uh, Benjamin, and uh, and then I went to Lacey, and he 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 signed me a recommendation letter and Mal Waldron. So I didn't realize that because you we are European, we couldn't of course do an audition because yeah, auditions sure. were like in North America. So, but <laughs> I didn't realize the 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 the, the fact that. Imagining Dave Holland receiving two recommendations from from Waldron and Lacey. About Lacey, me. yeah, exactly. I didn't know that. I, I have no idea. But you know what? I didn't have the same level at all compared to the other U.S. players and North Americans. I was feeling like really, really. Uh, maybe I had some creativity somewhere, you know. But I mean, uh, uh, who was there? Uh, oh God. Um, it will come back uh, because I'm, 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 of course, the second time I was there, I was more. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. 
case. But uh, uh, the level was so high for me. It, I mean, you know, uh, George Russell came and he sacked me from the band because I, I read like shit. I mean, you know, it was terrible for me. But at the same time, it was four weeks of, of, of heavy suffering. Uh, my reading was shit. Uh, I didn't know enough tunes for jam sessions. Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it was all, I was all wrong. And so this is when I decided on the way back that I was, it, and I had studied sound engineering enough that I had to focus on music and do things seriously and and mm. uh, uh which I was already doing but you know this is when I took composition class and all that and and then I came back to Banff uh I went there again three years later and I felt uh, it was I, I was more comfortable and I, I went there with Guillaume Orti the saxophone player from Quartet, Quartet yeah. there I met with Steve Aguelius Andy Mill, ah, that's Steve, how this connection yeah, happened also okay. Iverson, Ralph Alessi uh, this you're a day straight. There's so many guys yeah. from our generation that are on scene now. It was an incredible summer, and uh, so that's how I got to Bam. There was actually nothing going mm. on in France so much, you know, in terms of, of of workshops and stuff like that. I mean, it, they were like GIT or, yeah. or you know, types. But I was I was more, you know, I was since I was coming from that this Alan Silva Silva look at things. Uh, I was, of course, much more interested in in in, in the teaching of, of like Anthony Braxton or, or or the all the AACM thing, and of course the fact the the meeting with Muhal the the first time I was there it was also a key element in yeah, the, can believe in yeah. deciding to go to do music full time rather than maybe just sound engineering to make a living and some music to 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 have fun, you know. And Muhal was uh, I mean, he was between him and, and my composition teacher I had in Versailles. Yeah. They, they were two presences in my life that, that that also pushed me like, okay, do your thing, you do your thing. And Muhal was... Well, what was he like? Like, what were the lessons like you most important? Oh, it was first, it was a lot of fun because he was very funny. And uh, it was a it was a, an anthem for creativity. Mm. Take any any idea he would have us sit at the, he would play two notes on the piano and he would call someone to come to the piano and to play something next to that, you know. Oh, wow. That's... And he would say, pivot, pivot. The word pivot, just change, you look at something. Now look at it from here. What you can do with it? You know, this mm. a, a sense of transformation, you know, and, uh, Oh, it was it was great, and, and plus we were not so many to go to his class. This class took place at lunchtime, and we were I remember we were maybe six or seven. And oh, wow, that's uh, great. Yeah, maybe there were we were fifty of students or something, and and uh, yeah, maybe not not more than ten. Yeah, wow, well, that's it was, really good. It was a blessing, and, I, and we know very well now so many people of of, of my generation uh, have been studying with 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 Muha privately yeah. in New York and. And, and usually these people uh, who have met their, uh, who have met with 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 Muhal have have found a, a direction of their own, you know. Yeah. And, and I think there are people like this in in our, in, in the people we meet that suddenly have a key role in our artistic lives. And uh, definitely, yeah. And so I was I was actually extremely fortunate because if I didn't go to that Glenn Gould exhibition, I would probably never have heard about band before years. You know. That's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah, Co so, coincidences, yeah. you know, and of course, Gould was the guy who almost took me away from piano because when I restarted to play classical after after I got sacked so much by by um, John, uh, by, by John, um, uh, George Russell at, at the Bath <laughs> Center of 1987, I decided to go through classical music studies again in order to improve my, first of all, to improve my, my, my reading. reading. Yeah, my reading. Sure. And so, as, a, as ironically, you know, it's because of Glenn Gould, who I was almost about to stop playing any piano when I first realized the, the, the incredible capacity of this <laughs> great uh, artist. And um, and it's finally because I was interested in this guy that that I, I found the, the direction to the Bath Center, which which you know, it's 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 a very it bizarre. Still now to think about it because I'm thinking of all these friends. I'm still you know. And the uh, yeah. and the Steve Aguilius. I mean, Steve is in, in is in, in France now since he's in Paris, years. right? Yeah, he's in Paris since twenty four yeah. years. He's moved to England after a while, and and we've done 
I don't know, seven groups together. We're still yeah. going. We're playing Sunday. We have a new project on Sunday happening in Paris, and and it's 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 not only a comrade but a, a, a an ally in many in many yeah. ways of 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 looking at music and and uh, so that that came from the band center. It was the, 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 it was a connection, very very yeah. intense connection, you know. Yeah, it's uh, you mentioned these connections and. Uh, you know, Recyclers and Quartet, I like the Bay Window and those records you guys did. I, I love, again, you know, this, what, what you said, joining composition and impro, and you did it with both groups, but in very different ways. Yeah, yeah. But uh, how, how was your sense? You know, I played with many French musicians, but a little bit older than you, like Dominique Pifarelli and yeah, yeah, some other yeah. guys. And uh, they kind of built their own thing in the early 80s and yeah was there a sense of you i mean that's the idea i got you guys quartet and recyclers in the early 90s talking about paris kind of starting a new thing almost or what's your look well there's some of that i mean there was an energy definitely around the club instant chaviré mm -hmm. you know uh that's still that which is look, it still exists still still running uh, uh although since the uh uh the departure of one of the two curators it's become more of a noise place uh, oh, okay. not like we're like, like we're definitely too jazz to play there anymore i do play oh, wow. there, <laughs> i do play there still sometimes with evan parker oh wow uh, when the music's really really free yeah. i can still offer them to play there uh, which is cool uh but all that energy that was there in the early 90s uh where uh Different generations with, I mean, Louis Clavis, uh, P Pifarelli, uh, Texier, the older guys, Portal, uh, uh, and all the uh, young knitting factory scene, Tim, uh, Jim oh, yeah. Black, Chris Speed, all that generation. They were all uh, formatting. They were all coming to, to uh, even Lacey was playing there. And I remember oh, Lehman, man, really? too. Uh, this place became the center of the world for us, you know? And really, yeah. And, uh, uh, so Cartet started a year before uh, Instant Chevre started, and the very good fortune we had with Cartet in 1990 was we had a sort of subsidy to live in the okay. same house for a year in the south of France. That was consequent to to some work I did for a theater play there. They offered me to come for a composition oh, wow. a residency, yeah. and I said, "We're for." And they accepted it. So we found ourselves in front of us renting a house by the sea and practicing. And it was oh, 10 wow. months. So that gave, that gave, that anchored the sound of the group. And the, of course, the luxurious situation of having a little monthly fee to do that, you know, That's which is unique. Man. It's never happened again in, the, in my country, you know. And uh, so when we first played at Instant Chamire, we immediately connected with, with, with like Noël, actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mark Dugre got interested with, with Cartet. Of course, I was following Mark's work because he's, he's 10 uh, years old. He's an important figure in, in, in here. I love Mark. Yeah. And, and so um, uh, it's true that Cartet brought something, uh, also the recyclers that came a little bit later, a couple of years yeah. later. Uh, Cartet brought something. We, I think, started something where each composition was meaning a certain approach to improvisation, yeah. uh, a certain way to assimilate the material. And uh, I would say, because we were given ourselves some rules in the, in the uh, would it be the, uh, the, the, the scaling process or the, the rhythmic process or the just constraints, like in the French literature of uh, Oudipo, yeah. you know? But, yeah. uh, okay, if you play this, this kind of thing that finishes with a G while well, you're not playing a G for a couple of phrases or, you know, mm -hmm. and we were, yeah. training, we were training and that was a, a, a so big cool. part of our practice was to give, we would play actually riddles, Guillaume and I, like he's practicing upstairs and I'm practicing in the, in the living room the, 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 at the piano. And sometimes I would take a break and listen to what he's practicing. And I would just guess what is exactly that he's practicing. And sometimes at lunch I would say, oh, you've been practicing this and this, he says, no. And sometimes, of course, it was yes. But there was this idea of constraint within a composition that gave each each composition a, a very quite, quite specific sound. And Steve Steve Arguelles, when he we we first connected at the BAM Center, uh, 
Cartel already existed. And I think he got really interested by this, what we call later, ear attitude or mm -hmm. even ear altitude. What's your but, yeah, relationship to, to, to tonality? Why, why, would, why would, what, would a scale repeat every octave? You know, we were starting to ask, to take every, every musical object from, from, you know, from looking at it from every yeah. level and trying to, to just create potential, potentially uh, uh, exploitable material for, for expanding our, our knowledge or just yeah, language, but also yeah. collective practice. That's, yeah, that's so important. I think Captain brought this, this um, ironically, it, this band never played many gigs. It, it's, oh, it's, really? It's, oh, wow. No, no, we never, hmm. I mean, we never, I mean, there have been good periods where, you know, we, we've had like, okay 15 gigs in a row or something but most of the years we would play six six gigs mm. ten, sometimes so i have to say after 30 years now or 32 it's a little bit exhausting to uh, to to uh, to think okay we go again we'll do another album in november we'll see this time if it works you know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and when we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the band we had like seven pages in in the uh, in the French jazz magazine with photos and all that, and we didn't have any gig offer. Yeah. So it's very bizarre because we meet a lot of younger musicians who now somewhere not even born where it's when Cartet started and sure. who are actually influenced by, maybe not directly by us as players, but more by the the idea of something collective. You yeah. Know? And I, actually, yesterday I had an interview about the uh, Vancouver Festival. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the French uh, French speaking Canadian radio, and uh, so they asked me to look at the program and make comments. And of course, since they can't have people coming from Europe, which is a tradition in Vancouver Festival, uh, uh, their, their the programmation has recentered on, on, on Canadian artists, which is great. I mean, so this year, yeah, the, amazing players. Yeah. The, the Canadian scene will be featured like very nicely. But something I noticed, and I mentioned yesterday, was that there's so many band's name band names that yeah. didn't have any band leader or who's playing or whatsoever what so uh, so so uh, uh of course i could always click on on who's playing what but since you see a list on yeah. the, the web page of of bands i was thinking this is i think a, 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 a sign of, of of good health for music because i think that when when jazz musicians improviser improvises a develop collective thinking and and, and uh, uh, just shut down the ego thing of, ego, of yeah. having having my name big on a poster or this kind of thing it's very good for music you know yeah. so so uh, I wish I could be in Vancouver this year and just sit down and listen to gigs you know yeah <laughs> man yeah. Rather, me I'd rather too. Meet, of course in Vancouver yeah but I think it's interesting so there are young, younger players in Paris. One I like very much that you probably heard of. It's Antonin Triwong. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Antonin is just maybe 30 years old now. And uh, uh, he asked me to do his, to play on his first record. It was a duo. Uh, he was he was actually 19. Yeah. I said, I said, great, okay. So you write the music, you you give me directions. And, and so you produce this. And he did. He was not even impressed or something by being in the recording studio. It's incredible. <laughs> so these kids, I mean, so what I mean is 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 uh, now he's got two bands. One is called What? One is called November, November. And, and they're doing a super collective work. And when I hear them playing their works, of course, I cannot not think about Cartet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, groups sure. like the Recyclers. Although the Recyclers were more, was more centered on Steve's music. It's, I mean, I did write a Noel a little bit. Yeah, but yeah. It, it, like the last uh, record by the Recyclers is actually it's only Steve's music. So, uh, so it's actually Steve's who started this band. It sounds it's oh, really? name, but it's Steve's oh, okay, band. I didn't know that. Yeah, oh. yeah, it's Steve's band. He's he's produced the last record, and he's oh. totally in the. So now uh, it's we have been working with disco for a long time, uh, the, the bass player and harp player. But uh, because we've been comping pop groups, uh, I mean pop singers for a while, and uh, so now we have a record out since like it's released two years ago. Oh. After after a, 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 a no no records out for I don't know yeah. years or something. So uh, but yeah no this is this band doesn't play enough of course. Um, you know, but we keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And the collective idea, and the collective That's... idea remains. But it's true. When I recorded my my the record called Pursuit with with Michael Moore, François yeah. Hull, Zach, and I love that. Yeah. Uh, we were in the, in the recording studio, and I was telling I was the youngest from the band of the band, and it was my band. So I was of course impressed to be to have these guys play my works, and and I said, okay, guys, we're gonna have to think about a band's name. And, you know, Jean-Jacques Michael said, what, what do you mean, band's name? It's your name. Just put your name on it. And I said, no, no, it's, you know, you got it. No, but you, but no, you, brought, you brought the music. You, br you brought us together. It's your band. So it was the first time I put my name on a record, like, sort of bold, yeah. you know. You know. Yeah. And uh, it's, not, it's not an easy thing to, to, for me to do. So now, I have, of course, I have to do it. And <laughs> I do it. But, but um, what I like the most in music is the collective part, you know. And... Uh, so back to playing piano, solo piano, it's like, uh, it's collective in, inside myself because we're many people at the same time. Yeah, yeah. sure, <laughs> sure, sure. You know. Yeah, I mean, uh, when I, I just wanted to ask you, you know, speaking about collectives, you know, you, we mentioned the quartet with Mark and uh, Gerald and John, and uh, you, you guys did, I know you played with John's trio of Flood Stage, which was like 2008, and it, it's yeah. around that time I also did like a, a record and tour with Gerald and John. So I think we kind of yeah. met, uh, met probably those guys at the same time, or probably you even earlier. But how does your story with John and Gerald begin, actually? When, when did you guys... Uh, oh, I knew of them, of course. And uh, I think it's... I mean, John and I, we met at the, uh, on the outside, on the terrace of the... Uh, Sunside Club in Paris. Oh, really? Oh, wow. uh, he was, we actually start to try to remember what he was doing that day. And uh, I think he was not playing, but he was like me. He went to listen to a, a gig of Ravi Coltrane's group with Andy Milne. Oh, okay. And Ralph. Uh, and he was in town. And so we're sitting down at the, at the break and Andy says, oh, by Benoit, this is John Eber. And, and, and John says, Benoit, you're Benoit Derbeck, the piano player? He said, yeah, this is, and, you know, starts to be like, you know, totally like, okay, we got to do some shit together, you dig? <laughs> yeah. you know, we gotta... So when, when, when are you coming to New York? And actually I had a plan of, of getting to New York uh, three, four months later. So he actually organized the, uh, the gig for, uh, the, the recording for uh, Spiritual Lover. Oh, yeah which we recorded in Simpsons 2. And so we did a quick rehearsal. Uh, and I mean, for me, playing with these guys was was, uh, was a honor, you know? And um, so the new quartet uh, that I started with with, with Mark, uh, it was is a sort of my relation That's to really, yeah. um, the Americans. Uh, I, I, I like to work with them the most probably, you know, I mean, it's just so many great players, of course, yeah. I love to work with. I mean, but it's just that I have my a history that started with Mark Turner in, in 2002 with the, the record Phonetics, and we didn't we didn't tour that much. I think altogether we played six gigs with this mm. band. I've mean, never been really lucky with my bands as a band leader. <laughs> um, and, and then the trio with, with John and Gerald, we played as a trio for years, and, and we might even go on. It's just yeah. things have stopped, as we know, and and uh, so for me it was just okay i'm gonna join these two these two uh, uh complicities these two uh, you know fr musical friendships and, and write for them you know because mm, yeah. Donna was playing john's music and uh, mark was playing my music but then it was sort of it's a sort of venture of 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 uh of uh of these guys, you know, with, of my little history with America. When I've never lived in America, I've never tried to live there. Yeah, uh, I became a father pretty young, you know, was just thirty, and uh, so I never, I never, um, and I never felt a necessity uh, yeah. to to right. to try to sort of like make it in America kind of thing. You know, it's 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 maybe because I'm, I'm, I'm I was always more concerned about collective than than my own career. Maybe that's been a mistake. <laughs> I don't know. No. <laughs> I would tell. Well, I don't know, but um, but you know. So 
so when I see somebody write about me in France that I'm the most American uh, French jazz piano player, it's it's just really it's, oh, really? yeah. I mean, it's, and it's on a big program for a big festival we played. Uh, wow, one of the biggest we could play in France, you know. And and I I just see that, in the, and I'm in the dressing room with the guys, and, they, and I said, this is so fucked up because this is so untrue. Yeah, <laughs> also, it's so bizarre. Course, oh, I love yeah. my love for American music. Of course, is 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 total. You know, I grew up. Yeah. But and still. I grew up in America too, and then when I was attending the international school I was in, and so you know, it's 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 part of my culture too. Although I went in experiment the U.S. Uh, way yeah. of life, musically, yeah. <laughs> you know, Sorry. you know, with all the problems there are, you know, yeah, yeah, it's different, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, you know, I mean, oh, but but well, just one last question. I just yeah. not to take too much of your time, like. Uh, I just wanted to speak about one of the other American groups, which is more improvised, Illegal Crowns. Yeah. Which I found, find really interesting. Uh, you know, like Mary Taylor and Toma, they have been playing together for years also. How did you end up in that collective? Because it's kind of like a different yeah. Click, yeah. click of musicians in a way. Yeah. Although, although for me, it, it, you know, there's a strong relation in the idea of freedom. You know, yeah. in all these players, and um, it came through. Um, I met Mary and Thomas through Taylor, because I found myself in Francois Hull's sextet. Uh, Taylor was the trumpet player. Ah, okay. Oh shit, yeah. With 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 Sam Blazer, with Harry Eisenstadt, uh, and uh, and uh, so we toured Canada. Uh, Oh, what one was that? I don't know, but that's probably the year before, uh, probably 12, 20 and 12 or something. That's the year before um, Mary Taylor and Thomas came to Paris to play with uh, Mike Reed Project mm -hmm. at the Musée oh, yeah. uh, du Quai Branly. Great gig, by the way, I was there. Beautiful gig. And they had a day off. And so we organized an, an afternoon improv with these four people. In my uh, in the studio we share with Steve Aguilis, so where mm -hmm. my, my good piano is, and we had lunch, and you know, and, and we we record. I just put some mics in, you know, and, and just and we just free improvise freely, totally oh, okay. free, playing totally free, and the uh, vibe was great. We we had a great vibe, and we we thought, hey, let's let's try to do it. You know, um, next time you come to Europe, we maybe we try to record something. Yeah. Obviously, obviously, the recording quality was not good enough for me, for me to for for us to release. It was just a few mics, you know. It, it, yeah. it would have. But at the same time, uh, Michel uh, Dorbon from from uh, Rog Art label, Rogart, yeah. the Parisian uh, Rog Art label, um, I think I told him, "Yeah, I have this demo thing. You know, you want to listen?" And he, he and he said, "Oh, I'd love to produce that that band." So I think it's only a year later that the, that the cats came to Paris and we did the recording. Oh wow! Well. And it became a band, like really instantly. And uh, the four of us write for it, so that's another collective, and that's another idea of, of collective we follow that 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 we continue that I love to do. Yeah, it's important. Uh, of course, we had a big tour in the states. Uh, we had a two-week tour in the, in the eastern part of the states. Um, oh, really? June 20, you know, so it was moved to June 21, now it's moved to June 22. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But of course, playing with these three is like, it's a little bit like with John and and, 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 and Gerald, actually, they already have something tied together. So yeah, for yeah. Me, like, it's like you jump, you jump in the, uh, in a, in a, how do you say, a, a soft cushion, cushion or something. Yeah. You were all so nice bubbles happen, you know, yeah. and you, just have, you just have to, to, to find your own paces there. And uh, yeah, so we have two records out and, uh, and, you know, Mary is a very strong personality. Yeah. She, she has her, her ways to do things. Her writing is amazing. Yeah. And, uh, Right. Uh, there's always, I mean, I never never know what she's going to do, you know, which I love with musicians. And the same yeah. applies with Taylor and, 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 and Thomas. And I think uh, we're definitely off that line of uh, this sort of coaching approach of music where you should do like this or you should. Yeah, do yeah. Like I think every, every, everything Mary or Taylor does or, or, or Thomas does shows that uh, there is no rule to follow but freedom. 
you know, yeah. and, and so it's it's a great thing to play. It's a great thing to play with them, you know. Yeah, yeah, right. But also, I could mention Andy Mill, of course, because because we had a duo for many yeah, years. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we played sure. for a while, and Fred Hirsch also. We played. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Duos, and we had this this fun house band. I like. Yeah, I love that Jerry, one. Yeah. I work with Jerry Hemingway quite often. We're, but he, of course, he's based in Europe now. Uh, Elias was great to work with. I mean, you know, Malaby was in this um, Ellington project and. And yeah, I mean, you know, I'd be happy to to to, to work with the states, but I'd be also happy to have the cast come over again. You know, yeah, it's that would be nice. Starting slowly to reopen, so so. Uh, yeah, it will. It's there, there's a light at the end. Of the there's tunnel. a light exactly at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. I've been thinking about them a lot because we've 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 had a. I don't know about how, what, how you know, but we had session like artists in France have a, a little thing with their stages and uh i didn't totally drown you know but as a father of three and all that this period yeah it's been, it's been difficult yeah. it's been difficult for the whole world uh yeah. but i know that the american scene has suffered a lot and also i'm very worried and i mean also for europe but the, about the network itself the network where because what where we are remains like a niche you know it's not yeah uh, definitely uh, yeah. i know you know uh, but especially yeah, in the more say, open yeah. music field rather than the, the, the more dance the, the more mainstream scene it's 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 fragile it's so fragile you know and um, yeah there's many festivals this summer in france that finally opted for for take taking place which is great so i'm going to play a solo gig in, in a small festival called mouse but which is actually oh, really oh, a wow. great festival and and i thought it was never happened this summer but finally we get to play some some in the summer so i hope the same happened in, in the same happens in the states and slovenia and everywhere yeah, else everywhere yeah. so, so that day because of course the audience been waiting for us too i mean you know i'm so happy to go sit down to listen to a gig and with yeah. people love playing you know uh and listening to them you know it was it was it was great to sit down the first night it was reopened in paris i went to a concert of uh, julien Pont julien Pontvian's project uh, like very much this guy very slow music uh, mm -hmm. close to even medieval music but we've played with improvisers mm, and wow. so they played acoustically in, the, in this small venue i like very much and it was oh god it was so good yeah, yeah. it's funny right it, how it, much we missed it, it. Yeah. and also my, my daughter sings in, in the paris choir you know she's she's been singing choir music for many years and the level of this choir is amazing so they had their first concert open to public in 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 a, in a year and a half and and it was so intense to have that the vibes of this incredible vocal group yeah who who, who get the the walls and the seats to vibrate you know it's not like you're listening through headphones something or yeah. or, or looking some at something on your own or, or listening to a sound system the sound the, the physical sound is is the, the wave the transients it's, it's something physical that we miss so you know yeah i, mean, I agree i'm so yeah. glad it's back from the most people now yeah let's hope i mean you know yeah yeah soon yeah. back to normality so yeah yeah, yeah. kind of so. yeah 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 cool thank all you right. well for sharing well, all these thoughts and everything so yeah yeah well, I was so I was I did say a lot as always, but. Uh... <laughs>